It's an honor to be here. It's hard to follow Rabbi Farhi, Rabbi Rubain, and the entire class you have here. I feel like yesterday I was standing here before you, last Tisha B'Av, I thought this was the last one. And as Rabbi Farhi was talking, I was thinking to myself, God runs the world in amazing ways. That in many ways, what the rabbi was talking about, I'd like to sort of continue that thought. But maybe explain a little bit what's holding us back. We want something. We all want to be something. But something's holding us back. Something, when it comes to Hashem, is holding us back. And if we can today, just for the few minutes we have left in the fast, which is the day that God wants us to figure this stuff out. Tisha B'Av is one of the greatest days of the year. It's hard, but everything great's hard. You don't win a Super Bowl, and it's easy. What Tisha B'Av can give you, if you do it right, is realness. You're hungry. You realize you're a human being, and as much as you may have, you don't have the food to put into your mouth today. You feel gross. You feel like you need a shower. You feel like you need something on. You feel like you're, you're, you're stuck in this space of where it's not over. It's not starting. You're in the middle, you're in the middle of nowhere land for an entire day. And it's on purpose because God wants us to be uncomfortable enough so that we can open something up and have real conversations to think, to grow. To change, just like what the rabbi did a minute ago in his brilliant way. To push. But there's something going on under the surface that I want to talk to you about. And if we can get there right now together, together right now, a few minutes to understand it, just to see it before we try to solve it, it could change us. The Sha'aba'av started a long time ago. The root of it took place in the desert. Everyone remembers the story. The Jewish people at Canaan, they're about to go in. God says, I'm going to send you in. The Jews say, listen, we don't fight with the Jewish people. We can negotiate it, but we can't fight it. I know a guy. I'm not the guy, right? And not only that, I saw what you did in Egypt. Man, you're the best. You got frogs and blood and lice. You could pull anything out. We don't, we're not that creative. God goes, no, you'll be okay. You're, you're good. We send in spies. Remember the story? Now, here's the story. We, how do we know the story growing up? Spies go in. Spies come out. We're going to die. Everybody cries. Shabbat. And in their report, to what they use as the proof that we're going to die is they say, listen, we walked around. They had these cities. They were walled cities. You know what it's like? We don't have drones yet. We still have a couple more years so the Israelis have all their technology. We have arrows and bows. The sticks and stones may break my bones. You know how big that wall is? How am I going to get into that wall? There's a guy going to sit on top of the There's no... There's walled cities. No one thought of that. Not only that, they said, listen, we walked around. And everywhere we went, people were dying. Every place was a funeral. Eret Ochel Yoshvea. This land you want us to go to, first of all, we're never doing it. We're never getting in there. Giants. They got walled cities. And everyone's dying. This is where we're going to go. Wow. Crying. This is what we're here. Today was the anniversary of that moment. But if you look closer in the story, you'll see something went on here. It was a setup. These guys that went in, they weren't military men. They were leaders. Moshe didn't pick the guys, the spies, the way like, they're not like the guys in Tehran right now, spying out and destroying the nuclear reactor. They're leaders. They were the, the mayors. Each tribe had a, had, a, had a leader. He wasn't trained in military reconnaissance. So Moshe gave them an instruction. Let me tell you what to look for. Moshe says, Ma'arati Go see, Moshe says, what the land is like. And Moshe says, you know what you should look for? Look to see if the cities are walled. Wait a second. That's not fair. Moshe sets him up. Moshe says, go and look for walled cities. They come back and find walled cities, and now the spies did something wrong, and Moshe washes his hands. I don't understand something. It was a total setup. Moshe tells them to walk in and look for the cities. They come back and say, Moshe, we found the cities. God goes, what? You're crying for nothing because of the cities? You're crying because you're scared? I don't understand something. Moshe told me to look for the cities. What did they do wrong? What's the big sin? They followed the leader. 
So I want to share with you a study. There's a man named Marshall Duke. Marshall Duke was a psychologist in Emory University. And he was trying to understand the idea of resilience. He was a psychologist. Why are some people resilient and some people not resilient? How come some people can go through challenges and come back stronger? How come some people go through challenges and they're gone? You know people like this? Some people, you see, they went through everything in the world and they keep on getting better. Some people stub their toe in the morning and they're out for the week. Well, how come? Where did, how come there's some people that are total snowflakes? And some people are the strongest people in the world. So he's sitting talking to his wife. And his wife happens to be an expert with children. And she goes, listen, I got kids. I'm, I'm teaching kids in uh, all these schools. You got this idea. Let's come up with a project together. And they do. They go to this in New York City. They're about to launch their project. It was August to be for September 2001. What took place in New York City 2001? 9-11. September 11th, 2001. Guess what happens in 9-11? These kids come to school and they're blown out. Now, it's terrible, but it's great for science. And he's giving these kids tests to figure out which are the kids that are overcoming challenges, which are the kids that can get through the day. And he finds something amazing. The kids that are able to have resilience, what makes them resilient? What is it? It's not necessarily like a gene. Some people have, some people don't. There's something going on. Listen to this brilliance. The kids that, it, that are able to be resilient, that when they filled out a questionnaire, they knew everything about their family. They had grandparents. They knew about their grandparents. Their grandparents came from here, came from there. They, the kids that, like, you know, some kids that grew up, they looked as if, like, they, they began their, their, their whole history five minutes ago, right? Whatever they watched that morning, that's it. Some kids know about their grandmother, grandfather. They came from this place, came from that place. And what they found was, in each of these kids who knew their, their family history, there were three sort of types of stories they told. One story was what's called the ascending story. Family comes in, you know the stories of the family, we had nothing, then we, had, we grew, we have everything, everyone's amazing, everyone's perfect, everyone in the family is the best. The cousin, the uncle, we don't talk about him, that guy we don't talk about, this girl, but everyone, and the kids know that I have to get an A, you come home, where's my three points, I got a 97, you know that family? One family was called the descending story, we had everything, they took it from us. If it wasn't for those guys, or those guys, or this guy, or that guy, I used to, you know what I used to, you know what I used to be, I used to be, I used to be. If it wasn't for the all, I, it's my country, it's my country, it's my country. They came in, they came in, you know that story. Because then there was this one family story that these kids with the highest resilience all had. We had it, and we lost a little bit. We came from here, things were great, and then they got bad. We went to this thing. And your grandmother was amazing. And then we hit this thing, and this person got sick, and we overcame it. It's called the oscillating story. Ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. When a kid grows up and says, my history, because history is who I am. My family had ups and downs. But we're still here today. You know what happens to that kid? The kid becomes resilient. Why? Listen to this. Listen to this. Because we think we have good memories. We don't. We have terrible memories. Anybody here who's raising kids and the kid comes to you and it says, I'm starting for finals, I'm freaking out. You go, what's the big deal, it's finals? Remember when you were that age, you were freaking out. You don't remember it because it's perfect back then. We were all amazing in high school. Everybody had the perfect high school career. Always friends with everybody. No one ever, ever felt left out. Every shot went in. Every, every class was amazing. And even if you weren't good, you, you, you heroicized not being good. Because our memories are terrible back then. Everything yesterday, has a, we, we forget stuff. So how do I know what I remember, what I, don't, what I forget? How do I know who I am? So the science Marshall Duke shows that when you look at your life, when you think about your memory, when you have a history, the history actually, you don't remember all the history, it forms a narrative. There's a story that it tells. And your memory starts to fill in on a narrative. If you were younger and you heard the narrative of we win and we lose and we win and we lose, as you get older, as you look back at your life, you start filling in the memory of what fits into the same narrative. Ups and downs, making, we hit the floor, we can still do it. And when you look at what's in front of you right now, when you hit a wall in your life, when you go through your life, you don't go through your life clean, 
you go through your life and your brain says, where have we seen this before? You stumble and fall and you look up and go, am I going to lose it? Is it over? Is the market killing me? My business just got rocked. Walmart just got collapsed. Am I done? And your brain goes, where have I seen this before? And there's a narrative playing in your mind. And if the narrative is, we overcome challenge, you're looking and go, we'll overcome the challenge. And if your narrative is, as soon as you go up high, someone knocks you down, you go, they're knocking me down. And if your narrative is, I'm perfect or no one accepts me, and as soon as you stop being perfect, you feel like nobody accepts you. When you go through life, what's happening is your narrative, your history, what you get from your family, what you get from your own personal history, your narrative is actually picking apart all the different things in your life. Everyone has tons of bit of stimuli. Your day has so many different things you can pull in. You walk into a room, you can come out, one person goes, I told you we're gonna win, one person goes, I told you we're gonna lose. They both see the same thing because what they're suing it, they're not looking at the world, they're looking at it and they're connecting it to a narrative. Every day of our lives, we're not living in this world. We're living based on a narrative. A narrative of, if I don't have, then I'm not. You walk into a room and you feel different. Why? Because the narrative says, this is what people here accept and I am or I'm not. You can walk into a room, nothing happened except you're, you feel down or up. You walk into a competition with your wife, with your business partner, with God. What makes us feel high and low, what makes people resilient or snowflakes, it's not the person. They're all built B'Tselem Elohim. People are built with incredible power. You think our grandparents, I always say I come from an interesting background. My mother's from Munkat, she's from Ashkenaz. My grandparents are Holocaust survivors. My other grandparents are Khalab. I always say no matter. My, one, my, gra my grandparents from Khalab only spoke Arabic. My grandmother, she's rest in peace, spoke Arabic only. My other grandmother only spoke Yiddish. You know what it was like on Pesach Seder? there? One person giving like Kibbeh, hum well, Kibbeh and one person giving you a gefilte fish. You know how hard that is? To give someone who eats kibbeh gefilte fish, you know what that is? That's torture into itself. To give someone who eats gefilte fish kibbeh, forget about it. They think you're trying to poison them with the spice. It was a total rock, but you know what? They, both, both at different levels, but they both went through hell. Both grandmothers, different. But they, they're strong. How? It's not because they were born differently. They saw something. They had a narrative. The narrative of our lives. The narrative of your life right now, there's a story playing right now in your mind. That story is what's guiding you. The story of your, you could have had it from when growing up. You could have had it wherever. The story right now in your life and how your life is supposed to play out is how you're interpreting the facts around you. And when you understand the narrative, you can change it. And if you don't, you succumb to it. I one time was in Israel. Watch my time. I was in Israel once. I'll never forget. Every year, the, the Zechut should continue to take about 200 men to Israel. Most, 90% of the people had never been to Israel before. People from all denominations, not, guys, not people that were blessed with their Jewish education. Most people on the trip, adult men, 40 to 60 year old guys. Ne no, very little Jewish education. It was the most inspiring trips I do. Adult men, Israel for the first time. You understand what that's like? You know what it's like to be 45, 50 years old, the only time you ever saw an Israeli soldier is on CNN, and then you get to Israel and you meet these kids? You know what it's like? It's crazy. You know what it's like to walk in first time? Forget it. You forget what it's like you've been to Israel before. An adult, adult man caught walking in, seeing the, 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 the hotel for the first time, they go crazy. So the, the, the week culminates in Shabbat, Friday night at the hotel. We dance. We have our own minyan, and we like take over the hotel. It's awesome. If you're, there, if you're going to be there this year with God's help in November, we're going to be there. Come for Shabbat, hang out with us. It's awesome. Dancing and singing, guys, for the first time in their lives. They never went to shul. They don't have a rabbi like Rabbi Fari. They never had this before. In fact, most of them, they, it's called Jew jail, rather, they, they, they tell me. Sometimes when they go, to, they go until 13, then they book out. They're dancing by the cult, and what I do is we work it out. I, there's an like, organization that has Israeli soldiers. We work it out that the Israeli soldiers come right at the end of the service. You know how it's like, it's like a play. They're dancing and singing, and 20 young guys come in with, with uniforms. They go out of their minds. They're dancing with them. They're singing with them. It's like Ni'ilah on Yom Kippur. 
It's all worked out. It's all worked out. Oh my God, they're here. Who would have thought? It's all worked out perfectly. I have it on the clock. So the guy who gets me the guys, he goes to me, this, you're going to love this one. I got commandos. These guys are, are, the, these guys are the big, you, this unit, you can't touch them. I'm like, I can't wait. Friday night comes. The whole week, the guys are going crazy. We're at the hotel. We're in the corner in our spot right by the mechi. If, if, if you can picture the hotel, in the front, one back. Not the front by the wall, one back by the mechitza. So that all the tourists are taking videos of us the whole time. Dancing. We're ending the last Alecha Dodi. They're dancing the end. And all of a sudden, I see my guy. I'm like, where are the soldiers? He goes, they're here behind me. I go, where? He goes, all these guys. He goes, they're in plain clothes. They're top-level commandos. They walk around. Like I said, plain clothes? Those aren't soldiers. It's like, no, they're commandos. I'm like, we're Americans. We think every Israeli is a commando. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're an Israeli, we think you have a gun in your foot, in your shoe, in your head. I'm like, well, I don't care about, I don't care what they're doing. I want to see uniforms. I want guns. I want berets. Because, ah, no, that's not the group I have. I'm like, ah, this is the moment. He felt terrible. He's such a good guy. Because, listen, I'll make you a deal. I'll make it up to you. See the guy in the back? It's the unit head. I'll, you, you can go talk to him. You know, I'm not supposed to know who he, he exists. You can't take his picture. I'll put you in the back. You talk to him. I said, fine. That's okay. Forget my guys. I'm meeting the guy. I'm meeting the commando. <laughs> so he sets me up with this guy. This guy's like the coolest guy ever, ever. He's in like everything, Mossad, this, it, back and out of Iran. The guy's been in the army his whole life. We have this great story, which I can't tell. I told it once at, at all of conference. I have two parts of the story, but one of them I can't tell. It's not, I don't have time for it. But I'll tell you the second part. This guy's got the craziest life. He was in every part of the army. He, he was oh, a hero, and you're never, never going to meet him. By the way, if you ever really meet some Israeli commandos, these guys are the craziest dudes in the world, and like, they're so humble. You say, like, you know, thank you for what you do. They go, thank you for what you do. I'm like, no, I really don't do anything. <laughs> like, no, no, I'm sure you do a lot. I'm like, no, bro, listen, I didn't jump out of a plane and call, kill like four terrorists. No, seriously. He's like, no, I do, you do. I'm like, no, we don't do the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, whatever I do is not in Gaza. Like, we're cool. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're so humble, these guys. I'm telling you, I don't know what they do in the army, but like, they're like, they, they think they're regular dudes. So I, I'm talking to a guy who's like the, one of the biggest, coolest, Mossadiest guys in the world. And he's like, no, I do, you do. I'm like, no. So I said to him, you know, can I ask you a question? I said, do you ever have a moment where you thought it'd be over? He goes, what? Could you ever have a moment? I don't know, 1970. Now nah, it's different. Hashem should bless the world. Hashem showing us his, his strength today. Hashem should bless all the Jews today. You know, 950 rockets today in Gaza. 950 rockets today. Today. We're sitting in, in, in the shul today. You understand what's going on over there? 1973, Yom Kippur War. 1956, 1948. You know, there was a time where today, Tango, we take it for granted. We should always take it for granted that God's, that they're strong. They were, it wasn't like that. For those who are a little older, you remember days where like, they thought it was over. This guy fought in every war. He's on the front line in the, in the north. 400 tanks coming his way. There's four tanks to defend. You ever go to Tel Saki? Even next time you're in Israel, go to Tel Saki next time you're in Israel. It's like four, there was like four units. You ever thought it was done? You ever, I'm asking, like, you ever thought like, like it was over? Like we came to Israel, we tried, and, and we're all dead. He said, Never once. I said, how come? I'm waiting for the military strategy. You know what he says to me? Listen to, the, listen to the narrative. Listen to the narrative. He says, I'm not a religious man. I hate when they say that. I hate when they say that. I'm a chiloni. I hate that word. But do me a favor. You put on a uniform, you defend Jewish people. God, don't, 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 don't start judging God. Because I grew up, and by the way, to like a real Sephardi Tahor, I'm telling these guys are the holiest dudes in the world. Achiloni Svaradi Tahor, in my opinion, I don't know, this guy's like Eliyahu Navi. He says to me, listen, when I was a kid, I was like, I couldn't sit in shul, forget it. My grandfa grandfather was Temani. He made me come two times a year. Yom Kippur, you sit. You don't like it, you sit. You pay respect to Hashem. Pesach Seder, you come to my house. You sit in my house, Pesach Seder, I don't bother you the whole year. Pesach Seder, I sat in my house. His house. You know, he said to me every single year. And I was like, you know, playing around. He goes, remember. When we get to the point of Isha Amda, he'd say, remember. We get in trouble. God loves us like a child. He'll never forsake us. He's always going to take care of us. Behold, door by door, he's going to watch over us. He says, God's been saving us since Egypt. Do you think he's going to stop saving us in 1973? 
never in my life, in the, the worst moment ever that I think, God will ever leave us now. You know what that's called? A narrative. You see that? He looks at the world and says, we're going to die. No, we're not. How come? How do I know? Because someone told me a narrative, a story. And the story that they tell me is how I see the world. And I believe between me and you, I believe between me and you, I, am a, I never saw a study for this, I believe the greatest reason why we have a country today is because of the Pesach Seder. Because when an entire nation of people here every year, Hashem will be there for you, He took us out, and you go fight a battle, and push comes to shove, you see, you see the worst, you keep on fighting because you know Hashem is with you. It's called a narrative. You with me? The narrative played in his mind and allowed him to see a new field, but to hear the story. Everybody see this? Are we with me? I can't go next until you're all with me. The narrative drives the reality. Because if you'd have the narrative of God setting you up to kill you and you see those Syrian tanks coming, you give up. When you hear the narrative of God's going to protect you, you see the Syrian tanks coming, you fight. Fighting and giving up, resilience and giving up, is not based on the tanks. Everybody with me? It's based on the narrative. Everybody here? Watch. Watch this. Moshe Rabbeinu sends in his spies and says, look for walled cities. They come back and say, we found walled cities. And that means we're going to die. Not fair. He told him to look for the walled cities. Watch the Sephorno. Listen to what the Sephorno says. He asked to look for walled cities. Why? If they're sitting in walled cities, if you walk down the street and on the street corner are two guys at two in the morning hanging out, are you, you think you should cross the street? Probably. If you walk down the street and one of those guys goes into his house at 6.30 and locks like 40 different locks, should you be scared of that guy? Probably not. You got to get through the locks. But a dude who's got to have 40 locks in your house isn't the toughest guy around. The guys who are hanging out on the street corner at 2.30, those guys are scary. The guys who go in the house and there's like 40 different alarms that they set up in the house, online, virtual, those guys, okay, there's an alarm system, but you're scared of those guys? Moshe says, If they're stuck behind walled cities, they're scared of warfare. Okay, we got to get around the walls. We're Jews. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll, we'll come up with something. But if you're going to walk in and see walled cities, you know what that means? We got these people. If you walk in and all you see is walled cities, then we got these people. They're all sitting behind walls all day. They're all scared. If they're sitting in open valleys, they're like, bring on the war. If they're sitting behind walls, if every night they got to go in the city and some guy's got to close the big door, that means these guys are scared. If these guys are scared, we got to figure out how to get in. But once we get in, we own them. Moshe Rabbeinu walks in and says, look for walled cities. The spies look at walled cities. They're both looking at walled cities. One person looks at a walled city and goes, yes, we're going to win. One person looks at a walled city and goes, we're going to lose. The fight at the Sha'abab isn't the walled city. The fight at the Shah B'Av is the narrative. When one person sees a walled city, he goes, wow, wow, I see a walled city? That means it's over, we win. One person would lose. How come? Because what was going on in the Shah B'Av wasn't about Israel. It wasn't about whether we get into Israel. It wasn't whether they were big or small. The battle of the Shah B'Av was something much deeper. And if we don't go deep right now, and we don't get it in our own heads, we're, not, we're only touching the surface of the Shah B'Av. The battle of the Shah B'Av was the battle of narratives. Moshe Rabbeinu had a narrative in his mind of how God runs the world. When Kalev got up and said, we can go do this, Kalev got up and said, we split the sea for us. He gave us man. He took us out of Egypt. He was giving them a narrative. Hashem is setting us up. He's building us up. It looks challenging. But the narrative that Moshe had was the narrative of he's with you. He's got you. He needs you. You're the Jewish people. Don't be so small. Do you know who's with you? Do you know who wants you? Do you know who chose you? You're up against giants, like the rabbi said. You have a Shem behind you. Who yalachem lachem? Moshe Rabbeinu's narrative was when you see a wall, you walk through a wall. You have a challenge. You're scared. 
Do you know who wants you to be part of his life? Do you know who calls you a father? Do you know who loves you like a son? You know who's never going to leave you? The creator of humanity. I don't know why he chose us. I have no idea why I was chosen to be part of the world in which I get to walk into some shul in the middle of the city and have brothers and sisters. How come I live in this world like this? Why do we live in a world where no matter what happens in our lives, we're eternal? How come there's no nation to ever come back to Israel except for us? No nation in the world came back to their homeland twice in the world but us. How come we're part of the same nation that sees miracles every day? Why are we part of the nation of the How come we're here? God says, do you have any idea who you are? You think you're just a regular person sitting in a shul in the middle of Tisha B'Av? There's six billion people on this planet. You think every person on this planet is considered to be my son? You think you can walk in and open up a siddur and change the whole world because you're a regular dude? Do you have any idea why you're sitting here for in the fourth quarter of Jewish history? You're a regular guy? Who says you're a regular guy? Who says you're regular? Who told you you're regular? What narrative told you regular? Instagram told you you're regular because you're not as pretty as the next person? Netflix told us you're regular because our life isn't as exciting as somebody fake jumping out of, a, out of a building? When did you learn that you're regular? What part of, your, of our narrative taught us you're like everybody else? When did that happen to be part of our narrative? Moshe goes, everybody else, are you crazy? You know who you are? Go look for a walled city. When you see a walled city, they're scared in there. It means it's ours. But the spies have a different narrative. Listen to this. And then I'm done. Listen to this. You can't believe it. It's actually in Torah, like specifically. This is like a psychologist's dream. Today, yesterday, yesterday we read Devarim. It says, Moshe is giving the recap. Devarim is the recap. Is the recap. Right? Devarim is, is, is Moshe saying, listen guys, it's over. After the thing, it all happened in Bamin Bar. And Devarim is Moshe Rabbeinu giving the speech. That's the speech, the one o'clock speech you can get in Mashiach against Rabbi Fahir. I'll go to Rabbi Fahir just to make sure he's got somebody in the crowd. <laughs> Moshe will understand, I think. I don't know. I'll go to Moshe with him. I'll grab him. We'll go together. He says like this. You know what happened during the spot? Listen to these words. He says, you grumbled in your tents during the spies. You ready? The Tomar, and you said, B'sinat Hashem. You know what you said? You know how we're going into the thing? You know, listen to the narrative. You know what we're going into Israel for? Because God hates us. You know how we, you know how we see this for? You know how this is happening for? He's bringing us to Israel to destroy us. The narrative that they played was, God's getting rid of us. The narrative of Moshe is, God's bringing you into the promised land. Same story. No such thing as same stories in this world. One guy walks in, takes on the world. One guy walks in and collapses. Same guy, same life, same world. Two different things playing in the mind. The narrative is what drives your life. Your narratives. What does it mean, B'sinat Hashem? Listen to this Sforno. Not, listen, this is so Jewish. This is so me. Listen, it's me. I don't know if it's you, but it's definitely me. Why would God hate me for? What did I do to be hated by God? Ready? You know why God hates me? Because I was bad when I was in Mitzrayim. I'm not a perfect Jew. I have sins. You think God's listening to my tefillot? I have sins. You know what I look like? You know who the rabbi is? You know how holy he is? Anybody have this God complex? You think I'm, so re- I'm not so religious. You don't know me. If you know me, you know that God doesn't really love me. He loves him. Maybe I can come underneath. But me? They're sitting at, at the banks and they're saying, you know, you know why God's bringing us in to destroy us? You know why he's destroying us? Because in Mitzrayim we served idols. Anybody have this? I'm not perfect. I don't understand why I do what I do. I don't, I'm not inspired like other people are. I'm not the best Jew. And since I'm not the best Jew, you think God's taking care of me? You think when I hit a, a challenge in my life, it's God trying to make me better? Get out of here. You know who he makes better? The rabbis in Israel that I read stories about. You know who I am? Do you know what I've done? Get out of here. God is, I'm God's son. Stop. You think it started here? You think the God complex came in, in, in 2022? This is called Tisha B'Av. It gets better. Rashi. 
This isn't even like, even like guys, no, this isn't like a t- contemporary commentator. This is Rashi. This is what he says. Moshe says, he loves you. Imagine, God loves you. About him, Sunimoto, but you hate him. Mashal Hediot Omer, Ma Delibech al Rechimech, Ma Bilibe Alech. What you feel about somebody, you think you're projecting it. You feel he hates you, so you think he hates you. You feel self conscious, so you think God's not with you. God loves you. God says, You're my people. I put you in the fourth quarter of Jewish history. I gave you talents. I gave you a shul. I gave you this world. You know why? I want you to be great. I want you to be a piece of me. You don't think I know that you're not perfect? You think I'm killing you not perfect? Don't you think I know you can't walk down the block and see stuff that's going to pull you away from me? Don't you think I know that? Don't you think I know I gave you your background? Some of you had this background or that background. Don't you think I know what I gave you? You think I hate you? Because you don't think you're perfect, so you project on me that I don't love you. So when I throw a challenge your way, you assume that I'm leaving you? You know what that's called? Living in Galut every day of your life. Galut and Geula, it has to do with God's presence. You could be walking through the streets of Manhattan and you can be walking with God. It work. Rabbi Nachman says, everywhere there is something, in that thing is Hashem. You go to work, you're doing business, God's in the business. You're talking to your wife, God's in the com. God doesn't, he doesn't live on top. We live a life and we think that God's up here and we're down here and we're like playing a game with him. God's in the world. We can walk around every day bulletproof. We can walk around every day, you know, every day walk around and feel and hear the voice, I got you. Come closer to me. Let's do this together. But you, you're sitting in the room in 2022. Do you know what you are? Do, we have to, do, we re- do you realize what's going on in the world? There's a few Jews left that are sitting t- together. I was driving the streets, looking at the city, and they're all like going back days. I'm thinking to myself, don't you know the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed? It's a regular day for everybody. Hashem is crying and everyone else is parting and a few people are sitting in the shul saying, I'm with you, Hashem. Do you know what that is? Because I'm not as holy as... It. It's a narrative. It's a narrative. We all got it from somebody. Usually from school. I love school. Usually in school you get. If you're not, then and you hold on to it your whole life. And it pulls you from Hashem. And you go, listen, do me if I'm not, and then you become, I'm not this guy, I'm not that guy, I'm not like this guy, I'm not like that guy, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And what you're really saying is, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. I feel rejected. I feel that God rejected me. I'm not perfect. I don't know how to get connected to him. I'm not, I'm not holy, I don't feel holy. And I go through my life, and I hear words from the Rafari, take five minutes, and the reason why I'm not going, yes, because I feel like, what's, gonna, what's it going to matter five minutes? I'm never going to become him. The narrative continues. I'm never going to, a narrative. Under the surface, today is a battle of narratives. The narrative of, I'm not perfect, so I'm rejected. Or, he's been building you up to take you to greatness. And that's the choice. That's today. And the choice that a Jew makes on Tisha B'Av is to turn to that voice that says you're not enough and say, fine, I'm not enough. In the world of relationships, you don't have to be enough. To a father who loves his child, you don't have to be enough. I was talking, I'm going to just check my time. One more minute. I know it's a long day. I was with my son the other day, my oldest son, and we were at this program. I'll never forget this. It's so simple, it's so little, but it's so big. And I'm sitting with my son at at lunch. It's like a program for Pesach. One table over is a six-year-old kid losing it. I mean, losing it. Losing it. Like temper tantrum, like Parex. This kid's a great temper tantrum. I mean, like some people temper tantrum, this kid's like throwing stuff, doing, he's awesome. He's like, if there were like competition for temper tantrum, this kid would have a gold medal. The whole table's losing, everyone's mad at each other. The kids, the things are flying, everyone's upset. His father sits down for two minutes, he can't even eat, he grabs his son, they're walking out, the kid, he's dragging his son, the kid's going crazy. 
and I'm with my older son watching this happening. Of course, I'm not helping. You know, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. And as he's dragging out the kid, I'll never forget this, this little kid, he's getting like dragged out of the room. He like, the father drops his hand and he like, he rolls over and he, it dawns on him that he really messed up. Like he has a moment of tshuva. And looks up and he says, like this, it was like, it's a little six, he goes, sorry, daddy. Like that, sorry, daddy. And the father goes, okay, honey, no problem. And they hug, he gets to his leg and he hugs him. And I turned to my son, I said, you know the problem is that we think that when God looks at us, he sees adults. When God looks at us, he sees six-year-olds. One, I'm sorry, daddy. One, and if you're a girl, forget it, it's over. If that boy was a girl, he would have bought her an entire new thing. One, I'm sorry, daddy. Daddy, I, I don't know where you are, but I want you. I, I want this. I know that the, that the core of life is a connection to depth. I, I don't know how to get to you, but I want to get to you. I have this narrative that tells me you don't want me because I'm not holy. It's not true. I know it's not true. That's what brought down the Beit HaMikdash. I just want a piece of you. I just want, I want this. I don't know how to get to it. I want to want it. That one, I'm sorry, Daddy. When you see Hashem is seeing you as a six-year-old, and when you see and you adopt the narrative of Kalev and Moshe, he brought us out of Mitzrayim. He brought us through the world. He brought us to the city. We're sitting here in a beautiful shul. We're, 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 we're one text away from getting on an airplane to flying to Israel. My grandparents couldn't have a dream. Do you know what, what, what's going on in the world? And we get to experience it. When your narrative is he's building me, then when you look at a walled city, you see Hashem smiling at you. When you look at your own challenges, when you see the world, you say, I want to find more Hashem. But if you have the narrative of I'm not enough, if I'm not enough, then the whole life is one proof of I'm not enough. Galut and Geula. It's the choice of how we see the world. And my bracha to us is that we stop this self-conscious nonsense. It's held us back long enough. Enough. Chalas. Enough. If you're here, it's because Hashem wants you here. Let's do big things. Let's realize Hashem has brought us to this point for a reason. Let's search for Him. Let's fight for Him. Let's see Him in every point in our lives. Every challenge we see and see it as an opportunity for my growth. Let's check our narratives. And when we make sure that our narratives are strong, then whatever God sends us will be strong. And every day of our life will get stronger and stronger until when it's our turn to have our own moment we're about to get into the promised land, we'll be strong enough to get there. May we, as this wonderful community, be zocheh, to have the right perspective and together be those people that gets to see the time. We get to see the binyan beit hamikdash. Mehera b'amenu amen. Thank you so much. I uh, want to say thank you, of course, to Charlie for sharing with us his uh, inimitable passion. I want to say thank you as well to the rabbis, uh, to Rabbi Ruvain, Hazako Baruch, Rabbi Lawrence, Rabbi Ariel. Um, but I also want to say thank you to the, uh, to the entire Mufsin family. You know, um, first of all, that the fact that they've been sponsoring this event for uh, a few years running. So as I said earlier, it's a wonderful partnership. But they were sharing from even before. They were sharing a, uh, really a, a role model with the world. Um, Daniela was someone, if everyone could take a few minutes to just read up about her online, uh, and you'll see some of the incredible things that this young girl was able to accomplish with the short time that she was granted here on earth. How much chesed she did in her life and how much chesed has been done in, in her name uh, since she passed. And um, when I mentioned it, I actually saw one of the comments on the video was someone saying, uh, I actually taught Daniela in school and everything that they are saying about her is true and more. Uh, she was a tremendous Kiddush Hashem. 
and it is my hope that we uh, brought her a, a tremendous aliyat neshama, that we did a tremendous kiddush Hashem today, and we made Hakadosh Baruch Hu proud. And uh, again, I want to thank the, the Mufsim family for uh, for being here and and helping us do this. Uh, tens of thousands of people will have seen. Uh, these incredible, inspiring messages uh, uh, around the world. And um, it is my hope and my prayer as well that we are able to continue to ramp this up from year to year. We have in uh, we have a branch of Chazak in London that is running a program today, a branch of Chazak in Los Angeles that is running a program today. Uh, the Safra Synagogue last night ran as well a beautiful meditation program that was here live with Rabbi Ruvain. Uh, and on, and I think one of the things that you'll notice if you sat here today for a little while is that these are a little bit different than regular rabbi speeches. I think you'll understand that. And that idea is really the core of what we do here in the synagogue and in Chazak. And it is only due to uh, the generosity of the people that help sponsor these events that we are able to continue to do them uh, uh, on, a, on an unbelievable basis. And as well, um, I would ask if anyone uh, would like to join us and help sponsor some of the incredible Torah classes and programs that we run, programs for uh, kids of school age, programs for kids, for young people uh, who are looking to find someone to get married, programs for young families, uh, programs for the community, we do it all. We literally do it all. Uh, older singles as well, we're doing a beautiful event as well, uh, coming up for people from, I believe it's from 40 and above, we're doing an event. Uh, is that the age? Is the age of 40 and up? We're doing a 40 and up singles event uh, because they, that kind of group uh, kind of sometimes doesn't get uh, as much coverage and as much, and as much love. So we, we are always trying to do more and trying to do better for the community. If uh, you like what you see and you liked what you've seen, so you can approach myself, uh, Rabbi Ariel, Jessica, uh, and, and let us know that you'd like to be involved. I'd like to end by saying one thing. Tomorrow, uh, we have a program here in the evening uh, to commemorate the 30th day uh, since the passing of Mrs. Lily Safra Alea Shalom. Lea Bad Dov HaKohen Vichana. And this was someone who managed to affect the world to such a large degree that people who came from countries and religions that weren't our own were able to look at the kindness, the generosity, uh, and the charity that the foundation has done and sit and marvel, what is it, why is it that someone like this cares about me? And, uh, you know, we started off by talking in my speech about Dr. Magda Bukowski to ask why would someone who's not Jewish do something like that, risk their self, life, limb, family, for someone who is. And here you're finding someone who ha has dedicated so much of her life and, and the resources that they had to, to uh, developing medications, to working on underprivileged communities, to helping build synagogues and yeshivas and mikvaot, uh, to help clothe people who are freezing cold. Uh, there is a list of things, a book that they actually put out uh, with the hundreds of charities that, uh, that received sponsorships and beneficence from this incredible organization, the Edmund J. Safra Foundation. And, um, and I think that I would like to ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in the merit of the people that came out today, in the merit of Daniela Nechama Bat Rachel Shira, who was someone who lived only for what you would have loved, Hashem, for kindness, for empathy, for sweetness, for goodness, for tefillah, for Torah, in the memory of Lily and Edmund Safra, whose names are everywhere. They never had children together. But as our rabbis tell us, toldot does not only mean children, it also means deeds that are done. I don't know if there's anyone who has done more and over a wider group, uh, over a wider swath of uh, influence than Edmund Alava Shalom and Lily Safra. And it is with pride that I say that this is a synagogue that the two of them built, one with their mind in their dreams and one with her hands. You're sitting in the dream of someone. You're sitting in the aftermath of someone making a decision. 
I want to do something. Every big idea only started with an idea. You have a few hours left before Tisha B'Av ends. Think of an idea, something that can become something. And God will know, and Daniela in Shamayim will know, that this program really actually meant something. And it wasn't just something that we attended in order to uh, while the hours away. Tomorrow night we're going to be hosting in the synagogue a Shloshim event in uh, Lily's memory. Um, if you can attend out of Hakarat Tov, even if you didn't know her, it would be a wonderful thing. We benefited so much and we continue to benefit from the foundation's uh, generosity. It's going to start at 7.30. There's a program uh, with Rabbi Ruvain and Rabbi Lawrence together. And as well, there's another program, a separate program that's happening with myself. We're going to come together at the end for an arayat, for a hashkava. And as well, there'll be, uh, some, or there'll be food at the end uh, because what Jewish event doesn't have food? Even this event has food, just doesn't have food at the same time because it's a fast. At the end, the Break the Fast will be here. Please remember as well, if you're here for the Break the Fast, the Duberachot, Li'ilui Nishmat, Daniela Nechama, Bat Rachel Shira, the signs will be up down there. Uh, and as well, if you have it in your heart and it made a difference to you, uh, please say thank you to an unassuming gentleman over here who's going to punch me later for doing this. Or if, as I saw a couple people, uh, you I'm looking at specifically, who when I mentioned Daniela was nodding her head and saying absolutely that was who she was, uh, if you'd like to as well, please, uh, you can approach uh, Michael and let him know. I wish everyone to school the Yerushalayim. I hope that today was useful, was powerful, and was transformative. And be'ezat Hashem that we should see the Beit HaMikdash rebuilt. Me'ravi, amenu. Amen. At the end of this program, because most of you are all dressed up and have no way to go, we decided that we were going to put on some incredible films for you to be able to see. So if uh, you'd like to enjoy some beautiful films, one called uh, Rosja, shot by uh, Guy Orman, uh, was, is going to be playing. And as well, I think we have another one too. Uh, one called Ve'emunat Cha Balelot. It's called The Faith in the Nighttime, a film about some, about some incredible people who survived the darkest time the world has ever seen, the Holocaust, and walked out of it with their faith ablaze like a shining light. Um, those two uh, films are going to be showing here on the screen that is right behind me. I do need someone's help so that I can move it and not get a hernia. Thank you so much for turning up to Sklerot Nehan.